All right, how we doing, folks? This is the last set of notes and the last set of videos for the semester. You can probably hear my cat yelling. He's not happy right now. In any event, folks, let's get into it. Okay, here we go. Great. So, we're going to get into this final module on spectroscopy and all um, forms of electronic spectroscopy. And by electronic spectroscopy, what we really mean here is spectroscopy dealing with the electronic energy levels. So, transitions of electrons from lower lying states to upper lying states. Okay. Um, and we shall see how, um, in some forms of electronic spectroscopy, depending on the resolution of your spectrometer and the phase of your material, the rotations and vibrations of molecules can also be intimately coupled with the electronic transitions. Okay? You're going to have to listen to my cat. I don't know if that picked up on the microphone. T is not happy right now. Um, anyways, so the first type of spectroscopy that I want to introduce um, is photoelectron spectroscopy. Okay, um, so this is based off of the photoelectric effect. Um, this is one of the very first things we talked about this semester. Um, and if you recall, the photoelectric effect is based on this notion that we can use light to photoionize a sample. Okay, um, so typically we deal with, um, well, always with solids in XPS. Some more recent techniques have shown how you can do liquids on photoelectron spectroscopy, but it, um, it is not straightforward. And I'll talk about why we typically do solids in photoelectron spectroscopy. Okay, um, so if you recall, if you shine light with a certain um, frequency, that frequency has to be uh, sufficiently large enough to induce photoionization. Okay, so for example, if you shined um, red light, 700 nanometer light on potassium metal, nothing would happen. Um, it's not enough energy to ionize the potassium. Okay, so but if we look at what the um, the work function phi, which if you recall. That's the energy required to remove an electron, energy to remove electron. Um, the work function for potassium is 4 to 19 kilojoules per mole. And if we were to convert that 4 to 19 kilojoules per mole into a single uh, joule per molecule, Okay, um, we could use this idea of that energy being quantized. So H nu, I could come up with a specific frequency for this work function. And if my incident radiation, so I'll point here. If my incident radiation has a frequency that's larger than the frequency of the work function, then photoionization will be induced okay so if we look at that in a little bit more uh, more specifically okay so here we can see on an energy level diagram here is phi our work function okay sometimes this is also referred to as the binding energy because it's the energy required to remove an electron um, and so this is kind of showing you that example that i just showed here where if we suppose H nu here is 700 nanometers, you can see that's not enough energy to match the work function. However, if for example, this H nu were 200 nanometers, and of course, assuming the same potassium example, you can see that 200 nanometers not only will be more than enough to induce photoionization, but the excess energy will result in the kinetic energy of the electron, okay? 
So if we only um, use an incident radiation source enough to go to right at the work function, okay, that's called threshold ionization. And that will not result in the, um, the ionization of the analyte. Okay, so that will not result in the um, removal of an electron from the surface. But any energy just past that threshold will result in kinetic energy of the electron. And as you can see, that's what's given by um, this right here. Okay, so we're using some lamp and we're bombarding a sample. Um, if that incident radiation has got a great enough energy to induce ionization, we'll get all of these photoelectrons. And those photoelectrons can be sent through uh, what we call a hemispherical energy analyzer, which I'll show you in the next slide. Um, and then those electrons' kinetic energies are detected. Okay. So as it turns out, if you increase the frequency of incident radiation, you'll see a linear increase in the kinetic energy of the photoelectrons, okay? And so if you recall here, this um, value, this intercept gives us the threshold ionization, right? Because if we backtrack all the way down here, you can see this corresponds to an electron with zero kinetic energy, right? Which is exactly what you need for threshold. And as you increase the frequency of incident radiation, you'll get a linear increase and the kinetic energy of the electron. And if you guys recall from the beginning of the semester, the slope of this line will of course be Planck's constant, right? Because we have this very simple equation that just says, um, well, excuse me, here's the equation. Um, so it's a Y equals MX plus B, right? Y equals MX, and I'll say Y equals MX minus B because um, on that scale, the work function will go down you know, it'll cross the y-axis at negative values, okay? So you can see right there, the slope is Planck's constant, okay? So now my cat is like sneaking up and trying to attack me. This is hilarious. Um, I might get slightly distracted from him. Apologies. Anyways, um, okay, let's move on. So here is an actual picture of an XPS device, okay? Um, so, for one, we note that, um, so what I've described up here is just generally photoelectron spectroscopy, okay? Um, and of course, depending on the energy and wavelength of light, we will knock out various levels of electrons, such as either the valence electrons or the core electrons, okay? 